because America is also Canada, America is South America, Latin America, Central America, and so Mexico is part of America. Well, when I was an undergraduate at Stanford University, I was sent as an exchange student to Brazil, and I discovered an entirely new world. And so I thought, why don't I study something so different, I thought, from my own background. And I learned Spanish, I learned Portuguese, I studied in Brazil, Mexico, Peru, Cuba. I received my PhD in history with the specialization in Latin America and the Caribbean. But here, here is something that interesting that I'm going to really uh, tell the young students and uh, people who are you know, pursuing an interest in history. Uh, wherever you go, keep your eyes open and look around. And that's what I did when I went to Latin America and I saw a lot of Asians in Latin America. And I said, why are these Asians not in my history textbooks? Somebody has to come and do this research. And that is how I have come to focus on Asians, Chinese, Japanese, Koreans, and Indians in Latin America and the Caribbean. So when the Gatsby were, uh, 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 landed in Cebu, he immediately met Chinese there. And the local people say, yeah, these Chinese, these people call Sangle, Sangle, which that's why I asked some of you here if, if, if they're Hokkien speakers. Sangle, we think, comes from the Hokkien for Xionglei, which means come and go frequently. No? That's what the local people, because the Philippine Islands were inhabited by local people, no? by indigenous local people. I think when you do this sort of multicultural, multiracial, and what we call transnational immigrant history, that is people moving across oceans, across huge territories of land, resettling elsewhere, uh, finding themselves both in harmony and in conflict with local populations, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. There are many challenges to doing this kind of history or research than if you just stick to one country, what we call national history. One of the challenges is language. You have to learn several languages in order to do an adequate job. Right? So language is one, culture is another. You have to really learn to be uh, adept and comfortable and conversant. The pleasure of travel, right? the pleasure of engaging with people around the world in different places. One of the things that I like to do because of the nature of my research, I love to lecture in Asia uh, China, now Singapore, about Latin America, which is what I'm going to do today. But when I am in Latin America, I like to lecture about Asia. So I am a one-person cultural exchange agent through my work, by making work relevant and interesting you know, to people who might not think so because they know very little about a certain area of the world or certain subject. And with the many languages that I know and use, I find that uh, that is one of my great pleasures and responsibilities. Chronicler, no Zhang Xie, he said, look, these Chinese in Manila, in the Qiangnei, in the Parian, they're cutting their hair. They're having children and grandchildren. They're settling down. Why? Let me tell you why. This is the stuff. Facsimile, a, a copy of the book. We happen at Brown, so delighted to have one of the first editions. But guess what? This book has been reproduced many, many times. If you want to take a look at it, I'm sure the National Library has a copy, NTU has a copy, NUS has a copy. You know, they're just reproductions, but we have one of the original 1617 editions. So if you come to visit me at Brown, I will take you to see the original. It's really a beautiful book. More important than ever before. First of all, because I'm old-fashioned and I've been around a while, I don't really like this digital approach because you just see a digital image of a book or of a document. You cannot really hold these precious things in your own hand and examine the real material firsthand. So I prefer to go to the libraries and archives and look at the original material. 
Of course, it's sometimes very convenient to have digital because sometimes if you cannot travel or don't have the funds or the time, and if you're just looking for a few things, you could try to see if that material has already been digitized, right? But I don't think you can ever uh, make up or substitute for the real library. Let me give you one very concrete, specific example. One of the pleasures of working in a library, a real library, is you get to go to the stacks and you get to look at all the books. So you're there to look for one book, but guess what? You never just look at that book. You start looking at all the other books around it and you become interested in other books and you discover new material. That doesn't happen when you look up things digitally. You, know, you don't know what's around it, you don't know what's beside it, you only find the thing you're looking for. That's it. So I don't even think it's a very good research method just to rely on digital or electronic sources. If I may be so bold and presumptuous a little bit, I would like to say here, particularly in Singapore, to the Singapore young people, to the students I have met here at NTU, where I have been a visiting professor, is to say, follow your heart, follow your passion. I know that Singapore parents are so concerned about their children, they love their children, but sometimes Singapore and other Asian parents, and tiger moms, if you will, huh? they try to uh, nudge or even push their kids into more practical careers. And sometimes the young people I meet say, but I'm not interested in working in a bank. I love history, I love anthropology, I like to do field work, I like to poke into the archives. And I would say to them, follow your heart, you know, follow your passion. But remember, you have to be good at it. You have to work very hard, you have to be very diligent, and you have to prove yourself. Then you do have a future.